So I'm going to talk about time today. I mean, the time that we live in, the quantified unit of measurement where every event happens in. And I think of it very uh, similar to this conveyor belt, which is constantly moving, or something very similar to this mechanical hanger, which you can see in a dry cleaners. Every event is registered and bound to this completely linear narrative. Your phone calls, travels, and email communications happen in this linear framework. And what's, what's funny about this linear experience is that it has a very definite beginning and an end. Time, on a personal level, is unmistakably a finite resource. You can accumulate infinite amount of wealth, but you cannot have infinite life. The life expectancy in the United States is almost 79 years, and we more or less have a similar expectation at best. And because time is such a finite resource, we want to maximize our use of time. And all these technologies has been developed in a way so that we can save time, meaning we can do more things in a less amount of time. And as a result, the contemporary world operates in terms of global synchronization. From the finance, to the cloud-based data storage, to the day-to-day -day functions of your smartphone. Things happen in real time. And this semblance in simultaneity is a defining characteristic of value. And it's a synonym to efficiency. And all of this has been started from this invention of standardized time, which has uh, developed in conjunction with the intercity railway system as they needed to coordinate their uh, timetables of their trains. And in this view, everything and every event is flattened into this single and linear metric system. But I know and we know in our perceptions of time is doesn't comply perfectly with this concept. Time passes in different speed all the time. When I'm lying down on a beach, it's different from when I'm listening to a boring lecture. <laughs> and oftentimes I work on projects with people that are in different time zones. And that requires us to have meetings in odd times, a unique time space that we share momentarily. And I was working on a project in Korea last year for a public art festival that my studio was providing designs for. And because of the time difference between Seoul and New York, we were always having meetings at odd times, either very early in the morning or very late in the night. And one of the main curators of the event was my friend and collaborator, Taeyun Che, who was also based in New York and uh, like myself. And we, one day we were having this conversation about how our life is actually happening in between Seoul and New York. So in neither of those two places, so someplace else. And the conversation has grown into how our perception of time is actually different from the real time, the GMT. And um, in and how we feel detached from reality during those intercontinental video conferences. And in our perceptions, these meetings were happening elsewhere, not in New York time or Seoul time, so sometime else. And um, what we also realized was that we have no tool or device to uh, measure these personal senses of time. These senses are essentially ephemeral. As soon as you look at your watch, then boom, you're back in sync with the GMT. So what we wanted to do was to um, uh, conceive of a new measurement system that could capture your ephemeral senses. And perhaps we could create a device that, that's uh, equivalent of your watch that displays your personal times so that you can interact with it, then perhaps we could think about the network of these devices and think about the uh, negotiation of these personal times from person to person. Then perhaps we could create um, an alternative time system that is um, consensus time, where the bottom-up approach towards deciding what time it is now, as opposed to the top-down approach, where we're basically being told by the um, geopolitical standards of time zones. So we proposed this project to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for their Art Plus Technology Lab. And we are one of the five groups of artists to receive their first round of grants last year. And um, since then, we've been collaborating on the 
on the research and development of the project, which includes the organization of uh, public events, including the series of workshops that we call Timekeeper Invention Club that was first hosted in LACMA in the Los Angeles, and then in New York, and another one in Boston. Um, these workshops use what's called Timekeeper Invention Kit, which is just a collection of materials, tools and materials for the workshop participants to create their own timekeepers or their personal time machines. So what I'm going to show you is just a few examples of those personal time devices. Phonology is one way that you can tell time. It's a different way of telling time than Newtonian time. Um, the definition of phonology is a branch of science dealing with relationships between climate and periodic biological phenomena. I love this because I'm interested in ecosystems and I would rather think about the way the sun is moving around the earth than about minutes and seconds. So on one side of this little ruler stick thing, I have different plants that I love and when they tend to bloom, I started with um, the winter over here, fall over here, and the different colors of plants that bloom in between. On the flip side, can't look at both at once, I have my working life, it has to do with the um, semesters of the school year. And then in between I have how the sun works as it goes into its larger phase where we get more sunlight and narrows down at either end. And then on the other end I have the closer to Newtonian time, which is um, January through December in the calendar year. So what I did was I um, focused on qualitative values of time instead of like how to measure time in numbers. Because um, at the end of the day, I'm, I us I'm usually questioning myself, did I spend this day well enough to be satisfied? And what I call this project, well, this thing is, I call it time well spent. And what it is, is pretty much you start, you start off the day with this um, weight, with these um, pieces of paper on the one side, and then every time you you feel like you spent your time well, whether it's a minute or an hour, you um, add it to the other side. And you do it throughout the day, and eventually, hopefully, you spent your day really well. And every time you add, the weight goes to the other side. And once it hits the other side, I consider that a time, once, time well spent. So this is my timekeeper, my personal timekeeper box. And with each birthday, I go to this box, I open it, and you can see that um, the long sticks represent 10 years and the short sticks represent one year of time. And so right now I am 56 years old, so then when it's my birthday, I'll go to the envelope and I'll take another stick out, a short stick, and place another stick inside the box and I'll close it until the next birthday and it's my personal timekeeper. All right, this is my timekeeping machine and please don't give the secret away. In three, two, one, the slinger. All right, ready? Three. It's the wizard. It just whizzes. And this is what I do. And then I basically try to stop it. And what time did it land on? On six? On six? On six ten, I think. So the project is still ongoing. And, um, and this project addresses very important point in my design practice. I'm interested in designs of invisible. And I make constant effort in noticing and investigating those in invisibles, such as time as a global synchronization mechanism. Last year, I was in Barcelona with my wife. And we went up to the Montjuic to see the city the view of the city from the above. But what we actually spent more time looking at was at the other side of the city, I mean, other side of the hill, there was this port of Barcelona, the biggest seaport in Spain, where these container ships from all over the world come in and load and unload their containers. 
we were so stunned by this view, this giant orchestration of color boxes being picked up and moved around behind the city. And the designer Bruce Mao starts off his book, Massive Change, by saying that for most of us, design is invisible until it fails. And he goes on and describes how our surroundings are designed to leave us blissfully unaware of this artificial life. And the only chance of noticing the reality is through the sliver of design failure, such as plane crash, when this abstraction layer of comfortable intercontinental air travel fails. But it doesn't have to be a catastrophic failure, such as plane crash. Whenever our shipments from Amazon doesn't deliver on time, we search for our inbox for the um, tracking number. And then we put that in, in the UPS website, and the system tells you the hint of reality. The air travel from China, then the interstate highways, probably resulting in a slitless night of a truck driver, perhaps a burger and a Coke in a rest area. And then this pile of boxes in the local sorting facility. And many artists has been documenting this scenes behind this layer of abstraction. Edward Bertinsky has created a photography series named Manufactured Landscapes, looking at the factories of Shenzhen, China, where most of our electronics are made these days. Alan Secula and Noel Birch has created a documentary film named Forgotten Space, looking at the maritime transportations and beyond by interviewing people from containers and from the land. And there's this Korean photographer named Jo Chun Man, <coughs> who has been documenting this industrial spectacles, including the biggest container ship manufacturer in Korea, where himself has worked as a welder for many decades. And the most iconic thing in this dynamics between the, this abstraction and the reality, I think, is this Amazon's buy it now button. This contrast between this most trivial nature of a single mouse click to this heavy reality, the orchestration of the warehouses and transportation is too dramatic. It almost feels deceiving in many ways. And as a person who's involved in designing those things, I have special feelings about them. And in the class that I taught, the class is named Aesthetics of Automation, I talked about these issues, the complex relationship between design and technology and how the development, how the history of the development of, of those two are intertwined and its call for change in the roles of a designer. So these loose constellations of interest and associated researches are what my design practice looks like. I make effort in making personal connections with the culture and society, especially with um, with this underlying systems and architecture. And when I think about ta time these days, I think about these containers. These are full of stuff manufactured from all over the place, manufactured from the real people, or probably by the machines that are put together by the real people. So many hours of research and physical labor must have been embodied in those, in those products. And these containers are full of those as much as they could possibly put in, so that it can be carried away in a standardized form factor for its maximum efficiency. And there I was thinking, these containers are like zip archives in, in our computers. It's a compression of time and space and memories so that it can be picked up and moved around like a mechanical hanger, which flattens everything into a single and linear narrative. And in this view, time is such a poignant backbone to everything that happens. It's the ultimate measurement system that everyone has to share. And I want to see what we can do about that by inviting people to build and share their consensus times, which fluctuates beautifully throughout the day or throughout the year or even many years. And we're currently prototyping the hardware and software to enable that. And this consensus time will start from July this year in LACMA, where we're hosting the public event. Thank you.